And can we give a big, huge, excited welcome to my husband, whom I love so much. <laughs> Say, the way she said that almost sounded sarcastic. <laughs> you know, I love so much. You're so hot and wonderful and beautiful oh. and kind. And what if I just <laughs> sat here with the microphone? <laughs> I'm going to set this over here. <laughs> you guys are just here for the show. Jeez, come on. Oh, man. <laughs> awesome. You guys doing well? Um, we're, we're in a, uh, a series called The Spirit and the Word. I don't know if there, there was a graphic, but I don't know if they're going to put it up there. Um, but today is like I have a, a lot of really dense stuff, <laughs> and we're going to blaze through it for the sake of, not for the sake of time, but specifically because, um, yeah, we, we kind of experienced a lot of what I wanted to talk about already this morning, so it's like, it's just fantastic, you know, how the Holy Spirit does that. Um, what I wanted to do today is, is, is actually talk about the Holy Spirit and sort of introduce sort of who, like for some of us, uh, we grew up in a church culture or around church culture where the Holy Spirit was like normal. You know what I mean? The sense of like you talk about the Holy Spirit, there's gifts of the Spirit, there's all these different things. Some of us don't and didn't grow up around that. And so the idea of the Holy Spirit is kind of like this thing. There's like a word. We're not quite sure what it means. Do you know what I mean? It's like this fog in the room maybe or this ethereal sort of force, you know? It's the spirit force, kind of like the triforce, you know? Anyways, sorry video games, or it's, it's, you know, it's, it's like you're in Star Wars, you know, and you're just like the midi-chlorians, you know, and you, exactly, you know what I'm saying? It, it, it sort of feels like that, but the Holy Spirit isn't this intangible, this thing that's like this fog in the room. The Holy Spirit is, is a person, and, and we want to talk about who the Holy Spirit is, because if we don't make space we don't really truly understand. We're actually missing out on one of the biggest and most important uh, aspects of our relationship with God. And so we want to we want to talk about it this morning. And I, I hopefully, we're not going to. Um, if you have questions afterwards, obviously, please come up and talk to me because sometimes this this conversation will stir up. Um, like for for whatever reason, whenever I start thinking about this, I just I just picture the Benny Hinn memes <laughs> with the jacket. And, the, and it's like Darth Vader's voice and lightning shooting out of his fingers. How many of you guys have seen that? Um, I was actually in a, I was, our church hosted Benny Hinn in, when he came to Nairobi, Kenya the first time. And it was wild. Like, I, it, those memes are hilarious, genuinely funny. But at the same time, I was, I was in one of his meetings in Nairobi. And like, unprompted, there's like maybe five, 600 people down in the front of the altar and he, like without any sort of like hoopla, you know what I mean? There wasn't like, there, there's no coercion or anything. He's just simply praying and the Holy Spirit fell and it was like waves of just like craziness, just whoosh, just like rushing through hundreds and thousands of people that were just simply praying and just waiting for the Holy Spirit to move. It was, it was crazy. I'm, this, I'm 16 just watching this like, what am, what am I watching right now? This is the most insane thing I've ever seen. It's easy to make fun of it on the other side of a, of a phone screen. Do you know what I'm saying? Because you're not there experiencing actually the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so I want to, <clears throat> as, as weird and as um, meme-worthy some, some church cultures are around the Holy Spirit, I sort of want to demystify this a little bit, but then also sort of provide some real strong theological framework for you as you're growing in your relationship with God, or you've been for years, walking with the Holy Spirit, and maybe it'll bring some clarity and bring you into a fresh place. Is that okay? Yeah. Awesome. All right. So there's, uh, in, this is just some basics in case you're new, new to the faith or new to your walk here, um, or you come from a church culture that doesn't really talk about the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the Holy, Sp Holy Spirit is a third person of the Trinity, right? So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and, and the Holy Spirit is God. He's part of the Trinity, and he's equal to right? The Father and the Son. And this is, it, without getting into like some, you know, 
crazy, <laughs> you know, you can think about it as an egg. You can think about all these different components, all right, of what the Trinity is. But in reality, it's the, it's the person or the component of God that you actually interact with. And this is what people don't oftentimes understand about like the, the, the understanding our relationship with God. And this is what we sort of want to unpack this morning. Is that okay? When you're interacting with God right now, currently, you are interacting with the Holy Spirit, whether you call it the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. And this is, this is when you read scriptures specifically. We're going to read some very specific scriptures so that you can understand where this is coming from. What happens is, is when what I have found in my, in my walk with God is that you can have genuine moments with God but there is something unique to when you recognize it's the Holy Spirit right here with you. There is something that shifts. It's like, it's like standing next to someone and talking about them and being around them and then turning and talking to them. Like that is like the difference in your relationship with, with, with the Holy Spirit specifically. They, you know, sometimes it's helpful to describe this sort of component. It is a mystery. There's a component to God that is a mystery, and we will never be able to find the perfect words to describe it. It's just the way it is. If, if there's no mystery, then there's no faith. If there's no mystery, then you are equal to God in the fullness of what you can comprehend. I know that sounds strange, but like there, there has to be, there is a component to faith. There's a component to walking with God that you, like, I'm thankful. I don't ever want to fully understand. I don't. If I fully understand, then his thoughts are not higher than my thoughts. If I fully comprehend everything, his ways are not higher than my ways. Yes? If his ways are higher than my ways, then there's going to be moments when I don't understand his ways. If his thoughts are higher than my thoughts, then I'm, there's going to be thoughts that my brain will struggle with. <laughs> Have you ever tried to teach math to a kindergartner? <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? You will understand your thoughts are higher than their thoughts <laughs> in that moment. It's a mystery. Math is a mystery. How does five minus you take two away and you have three? This is a mystery. That they can't, is it a mystery? No, it's just that you fully understand it. This is where Paul says, we see through a glass dimly, but then we'll see face to face. Like currently in this life, in this expression, there will always be this context where you're looking through a glass darkly. But eventually there will be a time when you will see face to face and have the full understanding of what, of what it is. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that. And, and the context of the Holy Spirit relationally for you actually provides an anchor and a place of peace in your journey with God in this sort of in-between space of not having the full picture in all places. He was sent to bring truth, to reveal truth. And we're going to look at that in a little bit. Is that Okay. Awesome. Okay, so there's some different names in Scripture that, that get used. The Helper, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, if you have the King James Bible. You know what I'm saying? Get that ghost. I'm sorry. Sorry. I feel really silly right now. Dude, worship genuinely messed me up. Came over and prayed for me, and I was like, I was going to end. And then, like, we just, like, went crazy for a while. It's like, my God, I actually don't really want to preach right now. One of the terms, we're going to look at uh, John chapter 14. If, you, if you're opening your Bible, please do that. John chapter 14, starting in verse 15. We're going we're gonna to look at several verses through like three chapters in John. We don't, we don't have time to read three chapters this morning. You know what I'm saying? But I would if we could, you know? It's, it's incredible. This, these, these, there's these, this um, last sort of sermon instruction sharing that Jesus is doing with his disciples. And it's, it's one of the most profound and theologically rich portions of scripture. Um, in this, Jesus is using the word paraclet parakletos, I think I'm saying it correctly, um, to describe the Holy Spirit. 
Okay, it's the word helper in some of our translations. Some of us will translate as the comforter, the advocate. These are like the different words that we translate, but the word actually means to be the uh, summoned, called to one's side, especially called to one's aid. Okay? It's one who pleads another's cause before a judge, a pleader, a counsel for defense, a legal assistant, and an advocate. One who pleads another cause with one, an intercessor, in the widest sense, a helper, uh, an aider, an assistant in that context. Um, in 1 John, uh, John actually refers to Jesus as our parakletos before the Father, where it says he's, he is on the right hand of the Father interceding for us day and night. Okay, But in the Bible, the rest of the time that word is used, it's used to refer to the Holy Spirit in these chapters, and we're going to look at this, these different verses here in a second. So the first one is John 14, 15. It says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, capital H, helper, is the Holy Spirit, that he may, a, uh, that he may abide with you forever. It's really important. Who is abiding with you right now? I need you to answer. Who is abiding with you right now? <laughs> The ghost. Come on, Holy Spirit. Okay, verse 17. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. And then verse 18. I love this. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. In other words, he's saying like, I'm not going to leave you alone in this state. I'm going to come back. In other words, his second coming. But who is with you right now? The Holy Spirit. This is really, really important, you guys. This... It, 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 it can feel like a bit of a mind game for a moment, but it's actually important because I'm telling you what, there's something to recognizing the presence of the Holy Spirit specifically with you. If you have felt like your relationship with God has been at a distance, it's most likely because you were not aware of the presence specifically of the Holy Spirit with you right now. You have to, this is, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We have to actually allow our mind to be renewed. Until I began to take time to develop my relationship with the Holy Spirit, my walk with God was from a distance. And I grew up experiencing miracles. I grew up experiencing renewal and revival. I was a missionary kid. Like it wasn't, I, I wasn't like a rebellious missionary kid. I was like a missionary kid that was on fire for the Lord, chasing after him in all of that. And it wasn't until I was in my early 20s when I read this book and it shifted my, like my understanding and awareness of like, wait a second. I actually, like I pray to the Father, but like I'm engaging with the Holy Spirit. Like, oh, I, I can also pray to the Holy Spirit. Like I should also like talk to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is with me. Wait, wait a second. Like it began to shift my understanding and recognition of that, and it shifted my relationship with God from a distant sort of force that was there, and I'm trying to live my life and doing all these things. To all of a sudden, the presence of God with me right now. Let's keep reading. Is that okay? Jump over to John 14, verse 26. But the Helper. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Okay, so when you're in a moment and you're asking for revelation and you're asking for understanding who is speaking to you, come on, everybody. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. This is really important for us to understand. He's literally saying that I'm going to send to you a helper, an advocate, that will continue the teaching that I've begun. This is, and we're going to look at the verse in a second, but this is a really important framework. And, and Jesus is kind of throwing these verses in, in and amongst other teaching in these chapters. And then it sort of concludes in a verse that we're going to get to in a second. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Galatians 3, 24, right? This is where Paul's writing. He says, the law was given as a tutor to lead you to Christ. And then he continues in the following chapters, and he begins to say, you cannot keep what you received by the Spirit by the law. You have to keep what you received by the Spirit by continuing to walk in the Spirit. 
Now, it doesn't mean that there's a departure from the word of God. It's that like the, the source of understanding and revelation is coming through the spirit. That our, our attempt to walk a powerful and effective Christian walk is not dependent on just the, the law by itself. Do you understand? It's that Jesus came to, like the law was meant to bring you to Jesus, and Jesus is here, he leaves, and he sends the Holy Spirit to continue that work of revealing God through Scripture in your life. Do you understand that? This is really, really powerful because sometimes we begin to, like, where I think some church communities, like if I can just speak sort of broadly, have gone awry a little bit, or some of the damage around the prophetic or around prophetic revelation has been where this understanding in principle has has drifted away from this anchor point, which we're going to read in a little bit, which the Holy Spirit's job is to reveal Christ. And so you have sort of a genre of sort of Holy Spirit-inspired prophetic teaching that has no anchor in the Word of God and is not leading people to an understanding of Christ, but becomes its own thing. Now, sometimes it's not bad, sometimes it's not wrong, but it's, it's lost its way, and in that space, there are things that have gone awry. Does that make sense? I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that prophetic teaching or that sort of zone of things is all heretical. Do you understand? It leaves space for people to drift off into heresy. That's why you can have some that are like really, really good, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is like really powerful, and it's fruitful, but then like some people take that, and then they're like way off in left field. Do you know what I'm saying? Like interacting with aliens and co-creating planets and with the Nephilim sons and whatever. I don't know. I'm just, now, I'm just, now I'm just stretching. But do you know what I'm saying? Some of you guys in here are like, where did he just go? <laughs> I enjoy conspiracy theories. <laughs> if you didn't know already. It's a little bit of a hobby. I also really love the Nephilim. I'm reading about the Nephilim. Just saying. Pre-flood is it's fun. Just because it's, it's kind of half fantasy, half truth, all at the same, mixed together kind of itches both sides that I, I like truth and I like fantasy. You know what I'm saying? What? You guys. Oh, man. I, I know, I know. Yeah, it's awesome. One day, I'm going to get to heaven. I'm like, God, take me into the cinema room of heaven and freaking play me the movies. Play me the movies of what this crazy thing was like. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. <laughs> Savannah's like, no, no, thanks, man. I'm just going to stay with the daisies and the roses running the streets of gold. All right, here we go. John 15, next verse. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm in, I see it. You see? I went off in left field. Yeah. It's meant to reveal Christ. It's not meant to, like, take me down. The illustration. Exa- I was the illustration in this moment. <laughs> and that's all of- <laughs> okay, John 15, guys, listen. Verse 26, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. He will testify of me. The Holy Spirit ultimately testifies of Christ. Everything, the gifts, the fruit, the craziness, it is meant to testify of Christ. Somebody getting slain in the power of the Holy Spirit, it's not unto its own thing. It's meant to testify of Christ. You understand? The, 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 the purpose of the Holy Spirit is meant to reveal and to testify of what Christ did. This is where peace can come in when I pray for healing and nothing happens. Because I'm, I'm not the defender of God. Like, I'm, I don't have to defend the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's job is to testify of Christ, and there's things that I don't know. 
You know, there's been times where, and many of you guys have probably experienced this, where you've prayed for someone, didn't seem like anything happened, but the person still encountered the Holy Spirit and actually, like, it brought them closer to, to Jesus. Like, it actually testified of Christ. I've had that happen many times. I don't know the process and the journey of this individual. And what happens is, is we begin to hang our ministry success hat on something taking place. And now the Holy Spirit, instead of being part of the Godhead that we are interacting with, intimate with, close to, he's testifying of Christ and what Christ did. Now it becomes an invisible force that I'm trying to wield for my own success. The Holy Spirit is not the force that you get to move objects with. Now, if you move an object because the Holy Spirit somehow does that, that's fantastic. Whatever. That's up to him, and that's, that's, that's great. I mean, if that happens, you know what I'm saying? I've heard some, like, really, really crazy testimonies of, of miraculous things, people falling out of buildings and, like, floating to the ground uninjured. You know what I mean? Like, the Holy Spirit wants to do that. That's great. But he's not this thing that you bend to your will. He's not something that you manipulate into because you used some special prayer that you learned in some meeting somewhere. I'm serious. I, I'm so sick of the church manipulating God because they've learned some special prayer or some special phrase that somehow twists the arm of the Holy Spirit. Now he has to do what you just prayed. The basis of what Jesus in this whole passage, if you go and read these three chapters, the entire foundation is I am abiding in the Father. The Father is abiding in me. I'm going to leave and I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. If you abide in me through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's presence in you is connecting you to me. And by virtue of that connection, you are connected into the Father. And we're going to read this verse in a second. The Father trusts you because of your abiding in the Holy Spirit, in Jesus, into the Father. And therefore, from that place of relational, deep relational connection and trust, when you pray, the Father will hear you. Not because you said some phrase that you learned in some ministry somewhere. You understand? Now, rehearsed prayers are great. I don't actually have a problem with scripted prayers. They're, they're helpful to like, I don't know what to pray. And this is like, okay, this is giving me language on like how to engage my faith in this moment. Does that make sense? I, the problem though is people think that the scripted prayer is what's making this thing happen. It's not. It's your position in Christ. The phrase, pray in my name, is not a magic token that you wave around. It's a declaration of pray positioned in me. Pray from this place of authority. You are positioned in me. Pray in my name. In other words, pray from a position and posture that you can represent my name, which is my banner of authority given to me by the Father that now has authority here. And all authority has been given to me. So therefore, go and make disciples. When you pray, pray in my name. Don't pray in your own name. Don't pray in your own power and authority. Pray in my authority. Position yourself in me that you're ambassadors of mine and you can carry my name, my authority in the circumstances and situations that you're engaging with. You don't have to say, in Jesus' name, to make your prayer work. This is not like a magic seal or token. You, you guys understand. You can pray just as effectively, God, in, it, like intervene in the situation. Amen. <laughs> you don't have to conclude your prayer with, in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name is a declaration of your position relationally with him. That you're, you're praying positioned inside of that place. Now, say in Jesus' name. I am not saying I pray in Jesus' name because I'm reminding myself of like where I'm at, where my position is. Do you understand? Like 
This, is, this language is helpful. It's that you have to recognize what it's meant to do and not what it's not doing. Are you guys tracking with me? Sorry. Okay. Okay, John 16, verses 5. We're going to read a, a chunk of verses here just because I want to read the context. Because this is sort of like the conclusion of these three different chapters. It's like this big uh, sort of final sermon to his disciples. Then this, uh, this is part of where it ends here. But now, is this starting in verse 5? But now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I've said these things, do you sorrow has filled your heart? In other words, they're like, you're, you're missing the point of this. You're just sad instead of asking questions. Like, you know what I mean? Like this, this context. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. This is like, you got to understand, they are face to face with the Son of God in bodily form. Dead being raised, miracles taking place the Messiah that, that, that they have longed for as a people for thousands of years is there with them. And he has the audacity to say, it's better for you that I leave. <laughs> How could you? <laughs> I mean, like this, is, this is huge. It's, we have to understand the, the, the strength of this statement. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. So what is better for us according to Jesus' own words. What is better for all of you in your Christian walk and your walk in this life? What is better? Yes. This is actually really, really important for us to understand. It's not that Jesus is unimportant. It's that the, in this exchange, he goes from in bodily form in one location to the opportunity for believers across the planet to carry the same presence and power in their everyday walk. This exchange is really powerful. There's moments, how many times in your own life you were like, I just wish Jesus himself was here in bodily form to deal with this problem. I think we've all felt those those feelings. And and Jesus is telling you, no, 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 you don't understand. It's actually better that I'm where I'm at and that you have the Holy Spirit. Okay? Keep reading. For if I do not go, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness. So this is actually really important. Um, we sometimes uh, view, we, we at times, not everybody, I personally had this struggle. We view the Holy Spirit as the convictor of sin and not as the helper or the advocate. And so it actually impaired my relationship, like not impaired, how do I say, yeah, it impaired my relationship with it, it held back my relationship with him because it was like, no, if the Holy Spirit is here, I'm going to be convicted of all of the sin and the shame in my life. But it's actually convicting the world that doesn't believe in Jesus. He's my advocate. He's interceding on my behalf. He's here to help and aid me in my, like, does that make sense? The conviction is for people that do not believe in him. He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. In other words, that all of a sudden he's revealing righteousness because Jesus isn't here as the expression of righteous living. And so what happens is, is when Jesus is no longer there, someone has to carry the conviction and the revelation of what righteousness is. This is why the fruit of your relationship with the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Because he's revealing righteousness, and through intimacy with him, you see the image of Jesus. And the fruit, the byproduct of that is now you are also manifesting these same things in your life. Is this too deep for you guys? Is this okay? Yeah. Second, I got the second, third row with me. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> of, okay, of righteousness, of judgment. This is verse 11. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Who's judged? You? No. The devil, the ruler of this world. 
like the prince of the power of the air. Jesus came, he broke that authority, right? And then he sends us to actually go and establish his kingdom because the, Satan has been judged. We walk around with a distance from God because we, we misinterpret that as us being judged. Do you understand when you come to him? Remember when I talked about Hesed? Like, you have to understand, like, the actual position of God towards you is one of undeserved mercy. That he invites you to come to him in this position and posture where he's, he wants to give you this mercy. He actually wants to extend this mercy to you. And the price has been paid because of what Jesus did. The Holy Spirit reveals Jesus because he's revealing the place of access of redemption for your life that you can come in boldly with confidence without fear of the judgment that has been released over the ruler of this world at the time, which would have been Lucifer or Satan. Are you guys tracking with me? So sometimes I, I, I want to be clear because oftentimes we're like, okay, the Holy Spirit is a judge, and then we walk around casting judgment on other people. When that's not who the judgment is falling on in this context. God's looking to seek and save the lost. He's looking to redeem hearts. There's no one that's too far gone that can't experience the redemptive work of the cross. And, and sometimes what happens is, is we begin to walk in believer, as believers, we begin to walk in a way that is actually like preemptively casting judgment and decisions over people's life. That's actually, I honestly believe at times, is actually cutting them off from experiencing the redemptive work that you are carrying and meant to bring to people. The reason why they get to experience God is because the ruler that they were under has been judged. Does that make sense? The, the, the ruler that has been over the world, the, the, the sin, the darkness, has been judged. I've been set free to come into newness of life. Because the, the, the one that owned my life has been judged and his power has been broken. I've been set free. That is what the power of death, hell, and the grave, when it was broken through the death and resurrection of Jesus, that set me free to be able to come in and actually experience the fullness of God and experience redemption. And the Holy Spirit is the presence of God continuing that work in the world. And we're meant to be the ones carrying the conduit that that begins to happen. Are you guys tracking with me? That child is experiencing not the judgment of the Holy Spirit. But he's going, to, or she is going to experience the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Mm. He comforts all who mourns. Show. Sorry. <laughs> I need an organ hanky. You know what I'm saying? Do that, do that, do that. Praise break. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. Verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Wow, that's, that's, that's intense. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit is meant to continue the revelation that Jesus had begun. Does that make sense? Not in terms of new revelation or stuff that's like outside of scripture and weird stuff that goes weird. He's, the Holy Spirit is continuing the revelation of God's plan and purposes. Does that make sense? What Jesus was revealing the Father, the Holy Spirit is continuing that work. Okay? He will continue, uh, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me. Again, there it is again. He will glorify me. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Do you understand? There's like this profound inner working, this profound inner relationship of the Trinity that the component, the aspect of the Godhead that you are interacting with is the Holy Spirit right now. He's meant to continue revealing what Jesus did, continuing that work of revelation in your life, speaking the truth to you. All right, so skipping ahead, right? Acts chapter one, this is verse four and eight. This is Jesus. He's about to, be, he's, he's about to ascend into heaven, and this is like, 
this, again, this final declaration about the Holy Spirit. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, this promise that he has been speaking of. Which, he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. <clears throat> baptized with the Holy Spirit. Baptized, the word baptizo, the, the earliest reference to this word in human history is a, on a, an inscription for a pickle recipe. Baptizo, it, it was it, the earliest reference in this word was a dill going in and being transformed into a pickle. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Submerge. <laughs> you, you can't sprinkle the vinegar on a pickle, uh, on, a, on a cucumber and get a pickle. <laughs> I'm sorry. Guys, bad church joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I, I prefer sweet pickles. So. Sweet, sweet hot pickles. How many of you guys like sweet hot pickles? Mm. Ooh, sweet, spicy pickles. You know what I'm saying? That's my blend of the gospel, too. You know what I'm saying? It's a little sweet, kind of spicy. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I don't even know what to do. I don't know what to say right now. I've completely lost what I... Listen, the point is that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you are meant to be transformed into something different. Does that make sense? You are... You are it's like this... It's this, it's this thing that when the power of the Holy Spirit comes on you. This exchange, baptized in the Holy Spirit, the reference is to something that is so fundamentally transformational for your life. You know? All right. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power. I love this. Basically, he's like, are you going to establish, when the Holy Spirit comes, is that what's going to establish like Israel, and set us free, and the whole promise of the, the coming king. And he's like, listen, don't get distracted by that. But when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you're going to receive power. He's like shifting. My encouragement to you, listen, it's important to, 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 to follow the news, to, to look at the word, but I'm going to tell you what, the, the distraction of waiting for some eschatological event is robbing you from this exchange in your present walk. Does that make sense? It can. Some of you it is, some of you it isn't. <laughs> My encouragement to you is if you have gotten caught up with an eschatolog eschatological narrative and it is robbing you from your effectiveness in your present walk, you have lost sight of the promise of Jesus in this verse. Know that he's coming back. It's, it's happening. There's no argument about it. However, when the Holy Spirit comes on you now, right now, you're going to receive power to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Like you understand, this, 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 and this again, it again connects the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to testifying of Christ. Again, the, the final promise around the Holy Spirit is that it would make you an effective witness of what Jesus did. Are you, are you following? Are you tracking with me? The, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit isn't just to spruce up your life. It's not just to make your existence better. It's actually to make you an effective witness that your life becomes a display of the work of Christ. In two profound ways, and this is, guys, like I said, we're, we're, we are going through some deep and, and, and uh, some deep waters theologically. We're going to just hit it all, all right? 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about the gifts. Galatians 5, and Ephesians 9 talk about the fruit of the Spirit. The way that you become a witness is in two primary ways. The word power of the Holy Spirit is the Greek word dunamis, right? It's, the word, it's where we get the, the word dynamite from. It is specifically explosive, effective power. It's power that causes change. It's power that has an effect. That is what the word is. And Jesus gives you both dunamis and exousia. Exousia is authority, is the, is the, is the capacity to make things happen because of the position that you are in. And when Jesus said, all 
authority, all exousia has been given to me. So therefore, go and make disciples. Your effectiveness is because you are positioned in him. Again, prayer in his name, it's the authority. It's representative of the authority that's resting on your life because of your position of abiding in him. And your doorway to abiding with him is what? Come on, guys. The Holy Spirit. Your, your, the actual gateway to abiding in Christ is the helper that he sent you, that he said that he will be in you, he will be with you, and if you abide in him, you're going to abide in me. And I'm in the Father, and the Father is going to pay attention. He will actually turn and shift towards you because of your position. Go back and read those three chapters in John. I'm telling you what, you'll, you'll begin to see it laid out in this whole exchange. In the way that Jesus describes it, you're going to be my friends because you keep my commandments. You keep my commandments by loving me and loving people. Like it's, it just, it's like this whole thing. It's important. So dunamis and exousia, right? So you have this thing, the way that you become an effective witness, the way the Holy Spirit, one of the primary ways the Holy Spirit is testifying of Christ is through your life. One being the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, right? Prophecy, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, working of miracles, healing. Tongues, interpretation of tongues. What's the other ones? Praise, praise breaks. No, that wasn't, that's actually not listed. That one does not test, no, I'm kidding, it does. I'm just I'm being silly. But does that make sense? There's like this, there's the list of these nine gifts and then there's another verse that also adds in gifts of, of administration, gifts of helps. There's like these, these components that are a supernatural thing that begins to make your life effective, the power to cause change. Does that make sense? And it testifies to what Christ did. The, the reason why I can lay hands on someone and a miracle can take place is because of what Christ did. And this miracle is meant to testify and be a declaration of Jesus invading our world and saying, I'm not okay with the distance anymore. You will experience the, my, my presence right now. I, my, my goodness, my love, my extended mercy over this person's life is manifesting a miracle over them. Are you guys, are you guys hearing that? Okay, when you, when you prophesy, it's not to make you feel awesome. It's meant to testify of Christ. It's meant to testify of God's goodness. When you hear of a, a testimony or a miracle or some breakthrough, a life encountering Jesus of, 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 of whatever, fill in the blank, it's, it's sole purpose, the, the, the core, not soul, not the only purpose, the, the, the core of its purpose is to testify of Jesus. And to bring people to that place of revelation. The second way it happens is through the fruit of the Spirit. I'll tell you what. Oh, man. You're driving down the freeway. I had this story. This is a funny story. Uh, when, I was, when I was doing electrical work, I was on the, on the road a ton. And I was doing a ton of service work. And so it meant that I spent hours driving all over the Bay Area in California. Okay? There's a lot of opportunity in traffic to... Uh, practice <laughs> the fruit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit in my life, patience and self-control and kindness, you know what I'm saying, all these moments, but it's, it's interesting how you, you, you practice these different things, like, uh, anyways, this is, oh man, this, I don't have time for this rabbit trail. I cut somebody off on accident. This is a short version. I cut somebody off on accident in my big truck because I was the way I, I had to like merge over and it was like, uh, it was a super short merge lane that was like, yeah. I mean, it was, it was short and I had to get over. So I get over. The person that gets really angry, you know, blows past me, is flipping me off and screaming, honks, pulls in front of me, slams on their brakes, like so that like to force me to rear end them kind of and then like takes off. And then funny thing, a little ways down the road, guess what? had to take the same exit, you know? So they were like driving next to each other on the same exit. <laughs> Anyways, but when that happened, <laughs> a little flesh coming out, you know, just like, ah, you know, that's not what I did. But in the, when that happened, I had been in a process of like, 
like fighting for maturity in my life and actually changing how I was responding to circumstances. And it's wild. I still remember this, this moment just because it stood out to me. They passed me, screaming, flipping me off, honking. It was like really, really aggressive. And I remember I looked at it and saw it, and it was like, a, like an out-of-body experience where I just was like, wow, it's okay. Love you. I'm so sorry. My fault. You know, like I, I had no emotional response to this person at all. And I remember like this thing like kind of taking me back. Like as they passed, I was just like, that's fruit. That, there was no striving in that. Do you know what I mean? Like that is the actual manifested fruit of the work of the Holy Spirit in my life in that season where fruit just grows. A tree isn't like, apple, got it. (laughs) Do you know what I'm saying? Like, just like, please grow, 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 grow. And then a banana pops out. And you're like, yes, I got it. No, a tree simply roots itself in healthy soil and rests in the fact that it is an apple tree. And apple trees grow apples. You rooting yourself in healthy soil, staying connected to the Holy Spirit. The fruit is a byproduct of intimacy. Do you understand this? It's a byproduct of intimacy. You stay intimate with the Holy Spirit. He is meant to reveal truth to you. What is that truth? Sometimes it's truth of my own brokenness. Sometimes it's truth of scripture, of like understanding my relationship and my distance in these different areas. And I allow him to continue to to bring me closer to Christ, to continue to reveal Christ in these moments. And it manifests itself in more Christ-like behavior and choices in my life. At least that's what it's meant to. And then what happens is somebody is around, they experience that and they're like, how are you like, calm right now like your life is going through chaos like how are you able to like stay in a place of peace it's fruit of the spirit let me tell you let me tell you about what jesus has done in my life let me introduce you to this thing that you're seeing through my life right now in this moment i want to tell you about why our marriage has overcome like do you understand like people sit in our home or like i love it like some of the people from jujitsu where they're just like can you do our premarital counseling? Like, I don't, like, what, what is up? And you sit and you, the people begin to experience the fruit, the byproduct of us stewarding our hearts with the Holy Spirit. And the byproduct is this fruit that people begin to experience and it testifies of Christ. Are you hearing that? Oftentimes we have chased fruit from a place of striving instead of leaning into the Holy Spirit and allowing the revelation of our own brokenness that needed healing of of the places of our poor choices and all the different things to then produce fruit in our life. You guys good? We're ending in just a second. In like 20 minutes. (laughs) Kidding. I told you, spicy, you know what I'm saying? Sweet and spicy. We're ending in an hour. I'm kidding. All right. The last little bit, I just want to clarify something. I love this this, uh, story in Acts because it highlights something. So so first off, you have Acts chapter 2, right? The Holy Spirit falls, day of Pentecost. And then if you keep reading, there's a couple other moments where the Holy Spirit falls like in a similar way. And it sort of is like this, it's like this crazy thing. People gather together in one accord, and his, his presence shows up. You start talking about the Holy Spirit, you start making space for him, he shows up. And it, it's like this, it's this thing where like his, his presence, it, I don't understand it. It's a mystery why there's times when I, I it, my proximity to God, the promise of what Jesus said doesn't change. He's in me. And yet there's moments where it seems to be like he's more here. I don't have great language for it, but I can see it in Scripture, and I can see it in my own life and other people's lives, where there is like a promise of the Holy Spirit being in me, with me, and I've experienced it. I have it. There's a closeness. I can hear his voice. I'm interacting with him, and there's moments where it seems like his presence is more concentrated or more tangible, for lack of a better term. 
But what's crazy is you go to Acts chapter 18. At the end of Acts 18, we, we see this character, Apollos. And it says there's this, there's this incredible guy who learns about the Lord. This is at the very end of the chapter. Learns about the Lord. And he's preaching with fervor and revelation. And people are wowed. Like, whoa, this is like, this is really powerful stuff. Okay? And then it says that like, there's, some, there's these two people. Uh, oh man, this is, I should just read it. Because it's, 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 it's great. Just give me just a second. I don't have it in my notes. So. I don't want to misname people. Um, okay, so you have, so, and when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, check this out, Aquila and Priscilla, women can preach, just saying. Priscilla's there, and she actually uh, instructs Apollos into deeper things of the Lord. I, I love these verses because we gloss over them and we forget the actual implications of this. Where Paul's writing says, I don't permit a woman to teach, you have to understand that is a very singular verse to a very unique people and we can get into the real depths of what that actually, why that was necessary in that expression. But as a whole, there's these other verses that actually talk about women walking in authority and the ability to teach and to preach. It's really, really important, and it's important that our, in our church culture, if that challenges you, at, at that's okay. I'm okay with that challenge. I'd love to have that conversation in a deeper way with you. One of the, my favorites, if you go back to Judges, Deborah, she's judging Israel before she's ever declared as a judge or needed as a deliverer. It says people are coming to her for judgment. This is Old Testament this is before there was a king, and Deborah is in a position of authority over the nation, ruling in judgment over cases and disputes and things that are taking place. And then they needed to deliver, and so she charges, uh, is it Barak? No, is it Barak? Thank you. Barak, and, and he's like, will you do this? And he's like, only if you're with me. And they're like, let's go. And then they go and lead the nation in deliverance. Just want to say. Okay. So this is crazy. So Apollos, back to Apollos, right? So he, he refutes the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. It's like this incredible revelation. Well, then it's crazy because then he, this is in Ephesus, and he goes to Corinth, and then Paul comes to Ephesus after he's left. And he asks, do you know of the Holy Spirit? He says, of Jesus we know, but we've never heard of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul introduces the believers at Ephesus to the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they experience that component. So this is what I want to do, is if you grew up, the reason why I actually wanted to end with this is knowing the room that is here, knowing the friends and family that we have, I want to squash all division in the body of Christ around the issue of baptism of the Holy Spirit in the expression and relationship of what that is. Now, I truly believe the fullness of our walk with God is expressed after experiencing the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There is a component to your walk with God that is integral to baptism of the Holy Spirit, okay? That's not defined as an old school Pentecostal rolling on the ground. It's not defined any other way than the power of the Holy Spirit descending on you in a way that transforms who you are, and it's a manifestation of gifts and fruit in your life, okay? There is not a single verse that says speaking in tongues is the only and highest definition and marker of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. However, it's a very clear one that is associated with multiple expressions in Acts, but it's not the only one. And this is important. I grew up in a church culture that taught the speaking in tongues was the only marker for being baptized in the Holy Spirit took me years of study and like desperate search of scripture and then walking with believers that were literally could not speak in tongues and yet I mean hundreds of miracles happening through their life legit accurate prophetic words like legit prophetic words not just I think Jesus loves you <laughs> we're talking reading people's mail okay Jesus loves you is a good prophetic word, I'm just saying. All right, I just want to be clear. We don't have time to, to teach more on that. I just want to make that, that, that 
clarification. This is where I stand. If you disagree, that's okay. I love you, and that's fine. What I am tired of is in the body of Christ, a greater than attitude around this expression. Apollos was teaching effectively and powerfully to the transformation of people in that region, and yet wasn't talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? However, there was a component that was missing in their walk that when Paul came and asked about the Holy Spirit, they didn't know about him. And so he brought that revelation. He brought that component of a deeper expression and walk with God in that moment to those people in Ephesus. Are you guys tracking with me? I, 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 and this is where when he writes later, he says, some of you in Corinthians, he's writing to Corinthians, he says, some of you are, I'm of Apollos. I'm of Paul. I'm of Jesus. And he's like, guys, we're one body. Stop this garbage. Oh, no, I follow Bethel. No, no, I follow Evelation, Revelation, Evelation Church. Evelation, what the world? Elevation. Evelation Church. I, whatever church that is, that's the one I follow. And with that, Matt, you want to come on up, please? Thank you. <laughs> Gosh, you guys, what a morning. You know? Yeah, it's good. I'm glad. I'm glad. You guys are all here. Y'all stuck here for it. It's... Listen. Oh, my goodness. They're getting ready for KLS and stuff. I want to encourage you. If you want to grow in your walk with God, if you want to experience something absolutely incredible, please go and talk to them. Figure out if, if, it's, if it's for you this next year. All right? Ask your questions. Have them pray for you. You know what I'm saying? Come up for ministry tonight, uh, tonight right now. We're going to stay till tonight to pray. <sighs> My point is this. I want to, I want to, if you, I don't even know what I'm trying to say right now. Elevation Church. Elevation Church. That is just, I'm sorry, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to send an email this week. Please watch your inboxes for what I'm trying to say. No. Guys, I, I want to encourage you. This conversation this morning is meant, my heart is to stir up a passion and desire for you to walk in the fullness of your relationship with God. That you don't miss out on the actual closeness and person of the Holy Spirit with you at all times. That the component that it's like it's like God is like right in front of you and you're sort of like looking around waiting for the Father. I understand this might be like a play on words for some of you, but it's like you're you're waiting for Jesus to show up and Jesus is sitting at the right hand interceding for you and said, I gave you my very presence called the Holy Spirit who's right with you. Just look at him. Look at him. He's right with you. And my, my heart for you is that people in this room that feel at a distance from God, that that would shift this morning. That you actually recognize that you are, there's no way you could get even, you can't get closer to the presence of God right now. There may be times where there seems to be a thickening or a deeper awareness of that presence but the promise of Jesus that says, when I go, I'm going to send the helper. He sent the helper, which means he's here with you, face to face, in you, with you, abiding with you. And it's time that we raise our awareness and we wake up with a fresh perspective of the nearness that we actually have with God. That the Holy Spirit is here with you right now in this place. Man, why don't you guys stand with me? Because of time, I, I want to encourage you. If you, if you want to experience, if you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you have not experienced that, I want to invite you to come down for prayer. Our ministry team is going to lay hands on you and we are going to pray over you. It's as simple as receiving a gift. It's just like you receive salvation, you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's your belief, it's your faith in the fact that Jesus sent him. That exchange took place, and now you get to receive him in that way. It's meant to make you effective in your walk, powerful in your walk. 
both in authority and in the power to cause change. Dunamis. It's meant to testify of Jesus in and through your life. Come on, can we just put your hand on your heart for a moment? Hello, Holy Spirit. (laughs) Make me aware. Make me more and more aware. Man, I just want to prophesy over you in this room that you are stepping into deeper and deeper places of the presence of God. on it keeps on getting better it's your ability your awareness your experience of God's presence the presence of the Holy Spirit with you and in you man thank you Jesus thank you for your promise thank you for your gift Holy Spirit we welcome you come on around the room I want you just to use your own we're going to end but I want you to pray just take 10 20 seconds right now. Use your own words and just simply welcome him. If you feel like you need to repent because you've been unaware of his presence around you, do it. God, I'm sorry. Holy Spirit, I'm sorry for not recognizing that you are with me. If you simply just need to, oh, Holy Spirit, you're here. Hello. (laughs) Help us to stay aware of your presence, Holy Spirit. Help us to stay aware and to continue to live positioned and postured in you, abiding in you, in you and us. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. Come on, thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I want to invite you out this week to Life Groups. We have an encounter service at Central Campus. If you want to drive up there, myself and Beth are going to be leading worship, and it's going to be crazy. We have one happening here in a few weeks. Okay, we'll put it up. We'll make announcements and stuff. Um, I'm, we have that, the, the prayer room is going live, so if you're wanting to drive up to Oakland and, and be a part of that, there's, they're posting different, different times when they're open with live worship going. Um, and uh, come on amen love you guys have a wonderful wonderful day go go hang out with KLSM come forward get prayer and we will see you guys later amen